I'd like you to open your hymnals, please, and turn to Roman numeral number seven, right in the front, just two pages in. Everybody have that? The title of the page is Directions for Singing. You won't find this in most hymnals. This is a United Methodist thing. It was written by John Wesley to help the Methodists of his day, the people worshiping with him, to reclaim the singing, the music of their churches. Under the Roman Catholic Church for several centuries, music had been taken away from the congregation and put in the hands of professional musicians. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, actually. There was still music in worship, but the people didn't know how to sing. And the Anglicans, since they broke off from the Roman Catholics, continued that process. They had marvelous, as they still do today, in Anglican cathedrals. You will find in the Church of England boys' choirs, girls' choirs, mixed choirs, but the congregation is basically left out of the music. Only the professionals, those with trained voices, do the singing. But the Wesleys wanted to reclaim music for the people, and so they had to teach people how to sing. I'd like to invite you, if you will, today to, uh, to become a Methodist if you are not, and just move forward, and, and let's, let's build the congregation right here in the first five or six rows across the front. Will you please move forward at this time? We're always tempted in this church to sit far apart from other people and have personal worship, which means we end up singing solos. But we're going to join together and sing as a a group this morning, uh, looking at several hymns written by the Wesley brothers. And uh, we're going to start off by looking together at John Wesley's directions for singing. He has seven different suggestions. His first direction is to learn the tunes in the hymnal that you have. Now, the Wesley brothers published a lot of different hymnals, so he was instructing people of his day to learn the hymns that were in that particular hymnal. Most of them had fewer than 200 hymns in them, not like this one. This hymnal has over 700 (laughs) hymns in it, and it's a lot to learn. But at any rate, here is his instruction. Learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterward, learn as many as you can. Number two. Sing them exactly as they're printed here, without altering or mending them at all. And if you've learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. His goal was to make sure that when the congregation sang a hymn, they all sang the same one. And that's what this direction is about. The third, sing all. See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it's a cross to you, take it up, and you will find it a blessing. So join in. Don't worry about your voice. Just join in. Lift it up. Number four. Sing lustily and with a good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. 
Number five, and this one is a bit humorous, I think. Sit, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, that you may not destroy the harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. Number six, sing in time. Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Do not run before nor stay behind it, but attend close to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can. And take care not to sing too slow. This drawing way naturally steals on all who are lazy and it's high time to drive out from us, drive it out from us, and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. And num rule number seven, above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, Attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. So shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve here and reward you when he cometh in the clouds of heaven. A few years ago, when I was consulting with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Oakland, California, Bishop John Cummins, the Catholic bishop, invited me to a, a, a mass, a worship service, and he said to me, before we went in, he said, Paul, don't be disappointed when Catholics don't sing. He said, they're not Methodists. And so they haven't learned how to sing as a congregation. I thought it was interesting that he knew that much about the United Methodist Church and that he gave us credit for being good singers. Well, I wasn't disappointed and I wasn't surprised. They didn't sing, but they had plenty of opportunity to. And at the end of the service, he thanked all those who did join in the hymns. Well, we're here to sing together today, and we're going to start off by singing a little known hymn by Charles Wesley, one of the two Wesley brothers, John and Charles. So will you turn please to our first hymn, which is 417, 417. I want to say a few I want to say a few words about this Joe If we may, I'd, I'd like to say a few words about this hymn. One of the things you're going to notice as you sing this hymn is that the word heart appears over and over again. It's a very Wesleyan hymn. The, the, the Methodist theology, the, the theology of the Wesley brothers was really a theology of the heart. The heart is, according to them, is our deepest part. It's the most important part of our lives. It's the part that, that contains our motives, that the things we most deeply believe, what we hold most fiercely. And so that's the part that God wants to get into. And so the, you will find in the Wesley hymns a continuous effort upon the uh, emphasis upon the heart. When John Wesley described his own conversion experience when he felt that he gave his life to Christ, 
he, he described it in this way. My heart was strangely warmed. Well, we hope that all of our hearts can be strangely warmed by the Spirit of God entering us at a very deep level. And this hymn expresses those thoughts exactly. Will you read hymn uh, verse number four with me, four and five? A heart in, in every, every thought, thought renewed and, and full of love divine, divine perfect, perfect and, and right and, and pure and, and good, good a copy lord, lord of thine thy nature gracious lord, lord impart come, come quickly from above, above. write thy, thy new name, name upon, upon my heart Thy new best name of love. Write love upon my heart. Wow. Now let us sing verse number one. to hear a congregation sing. Now let's sing with more gusto verse number two. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. going to move now to a different kind of hymn, a Christmas hymn. Charles Wesley was extremely versatile. He wrote over 9,000 hymns. That, that boils down to at least 10 verses of poetry per day. And uh, that's actually what he tried to do, to compose 10 verses of poetry every day. He learned to express his faith through hymns. And we've had members of this church who have described themselves as, as singing their faith, learning to sing their faith. I remember a conversation with Carol Bradford. Remember Carol? Carol was one of the soloists in our choir many years ago. Well, Carol said she learned her faith by singing hymns. And she could tell you when we talked about a certain aspect of the Christian faith, she'd immediately call up a hymn that she knew that said the same thing or that dealt with that topic. Well, Charles Wesley wrote a lot of hymns and one of the hymns that he wrote was a Christmas hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Hymn 196. Let's turn to that, please. Come now, long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. One person said the best way to read a Charles Wesley hymn is to look for the verbs. So let's look for the verbs in this poem. Come, thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us 
find our rest in thee, Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. A second way to read a Charles Wesley hymn is to, is to see how he practiced the, a, a poet's practice of using the same word many times in, in a phrase. And that's we, what we find in the second verse here, the second stanza, where he uses the word born over and over again. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring, by thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Let us sing verse 2 of this carol. Somebody did a poll of favorite Christmas carols, and everybody expected Bing Crosby and White Christmas to win. But what really won was a hymn by Charles Wesley entitled, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Amazing. Charlie did it again. A favorite hymn, the Favorite Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. When Queen Elizabeth I of England passed away, at her funeral, a Charles Wesley hymn was sung, chosen because it was felt to be most appropriate for the Queen. Let's turn to page 384 and look at that hymn. 384. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies. Crown. Very few of us wear crowns, but she wore a crown. Look at verse 4. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory I'm sorry, Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. And the fourth verse, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, 
change from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Let us sing verses three and four. pastor and hymn writer whose name was Top Lady, and he wrote a hymn called Rock of Ages, which most of us probably know. But Wesley refused to have that hymn sung at any of his Methodist services. And the reason for it is that there's a passage in that hymn that is very Calvinistic and refers only to a few people being saved by Christ. Only a few, the, the chosen frozen. Anyway, those who are chosen and everybody else is left out. Well, Wesley didn't believe that. He believed that Christ died for all and that there is nobody who is neglected or left out, that all people are welcomed into the Christian faith and are welcomed into God's presence. And that's what he emphasized. Top Lady was so angry that he threatened to tar and feather John Wesley. But, uh, but of course he didn't. And Wesley continued to do what he did and Top Lady continued to be a Calvinist. So that's a little anecdote out of the past. We're going to turn a corner now and move up about a century. I'd like you to move to the, the industrial age, the age of urbanization in America. No longer were people living, were the majority of people living on farms in this country. After the Civil War, there was a huge movement with industrialization into, from the farms into the cities. That's when Chicago grew exponentially that's when New York City grew. That's when the cities, the big cities, came into being in our country. And the farms were deserted as people left the farm and moved into the city. But when they moved into the city, they found themselves working in, in jobs that were meaningless, jobs that were oppressive, jobs that were exploitative. There was abuse of women, there was child labor, there was uh, uh, legal action taken against any attempt to form a labor union. And so the, the 
preachers, the pastors of this day, started to preach uh, about the coming of the kingdom of God, declaring Jesus' emphasis upon the kingdom and suggesting that there be greater justice for all, suggesting that labor unions have a right to exist, that people can speak up, ending child labor, ending the exploitation of women. Well, we're still at it, aren't we? The end of the Industrial Revolution has not yet come. But there was one pastor, a Methodist pastor in New York City, whose name was Frank Mason North. He was a, a very active pastor, and he sought more than anything else an end to the, the abuse of people that was taking uh, place in our nation, in our cities especially. He was, uh, uh, he even served a term as one of the founders of the Federal Council of Churches because he took an ecumenical stance of bringing churches together for a common witness, just as we do in this congregation with our three traditions here. Well, what Frank Mason North did was write a poem. He said he'd never written a poem like this before when somebody urged him to write a poem, a hymn, that would speak about the social gospel, the social implications of the Christian faith. But he finally showed up one day at a meeting with a hymn in hand. And the hymn was hymn number 427 in our hymnal. It's interesting that he was uh, afraid for this hymn. He was afraid that to do it, to write it, he was afraid that it would not be received. But you find this, this hymn is found today in over 300 published hymnals of almost all denominations in the world. It's been an amazing, had an amazing life of its own. Let's look at the first verse. Where cross the crowded ways of life? Anybody been in a traffic jam lately? Where sound the cries of race and clan? That's still going on? Above the noise of selfish strife, we hear thy voice, O Son of Man. This is a prayer. This is a prayer to Jesus. Frank Mason North's prayer, a city pastor praying in haunts of wretchedness and need on shadow thresholds dark with fear. From paths where hide the lures of creed, greed, we catch the vision of your tears. From tender childhood's helplessness, from woman's grief, man's burden toil, from famished souls, from sorrow's streets, your heart has never known recoil. Join me, please, in reading the fourth, fifth, and sixth verses. The, the cup, cup of, of water, water given, given for, for you still holds the freshness of your of grace. Your grace. Yet long these multitudes, multitudes to view the, the sweet, sweet compassion, compassion of your, of your face. face. O Master from the mountainside, make haste to heal these hearts of pain. Among these restless throngs abide, O tread the city's streets again, till all the world shall learn your love and follow where your feet have trod. 
still, still glorious from your heaven above, above shall come, come the city of your of God. God. Let us sing these verses four, five, and six. <coughs>